want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men may see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He is the way.
Worship you, you set us free. You set us free, That's it. Let's go after God tonight. Lift up your voice and worship Him. Oh, Jesus, we praise You. We worship You.
worship you with all our hearts. I have felt the wind blow Whispering your name And I have seen your tears fall When I watched the rain How could I say There is no God when all around creation calls a singing bird, a mighty tree, the vast expanse of open sea. See 
Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice and worship Jesus. Let's press into the Lord. Let's press into God. Let's just consciously focus all of our mind and heart and energy on exalting God now, on magnifying Him and praising Him and adoring Him and giving Him thanks. Jesus. Lord, we want to be closer to you, Jesus, than anything this world has to offer.
before the Lord we're just gonna have a time of beseeching God interceding for this nation for America we pray all the time for the nations of the world we have a tremendous burden for nations around the world for all different people groups but right now America is in a crucial time and as America goes much of the rest of the world goes so we want to ask everyone if you're not an American we want you to pray with us if you've had it with your country and you don't feel like praying anymore, pray again. God's ear is open. God's ear is open. We're not telling him how to do what he needs to do. We're not saying, Lord, you've got to get this one in and this one in and this one in. We, we want God's will and the elections that are coming up. We want God's kingdom to come. As voters, we'll make clear choices and, and stand on moral principles and do what's right. But we're asking God now to have his way to cause his kingdom to come in power and to foil plans of darkness. Thank you, Jesus. Jody, why don't you come up here? We're going to pray. I want to invite you to open up your heart. Listen, prayer is the great resource God has given us. All the riches of heaven are available to meet needs on earth, to change things on earth. And prayer is our way of connecting and tapping in. Let's pray in faith. Let's ask God to move. However you feel to pray, just pray. Pour your heart out. Jesus. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus. Father, we need you desperately. We're crying out, God. We're crying out for you tonight, Lord Jesus. Father, we need a move of the Holy Spirit, Lord, in our nation, Jesus. Lord, change our hearts. Change us, Jesus. We need your touch, Lord God. We can't live without you, Jesus. 
Jesus, Jesus, even in this place tonight, Lord, increase the burden. Give us the burden, Lord Jesus. Father, impart a piece of your heart unto us even this night, Jesus. Lord God, that we can continue to believe and trust in you, Father, to move mightily in this country, Lord. We're asking you in the name of Jesus, Lord God, to move in the leadership in this country. In the leadership, Lord, even even in about what's to happen, Lord, in the election, Lord God, you know, you know the man of God. You know the man that can hear from you, Lord Jesus. You know the man that'll be most sensitive to you and your spirit. Lord, allow that man to uh, be in that position, God. The anointed and the appointed man of God, Father, in the in the position of the presidency, Lord God, and all the leaders, uh, from the governors, Lord God, down to the mayors, Lord, to the to the senators, every single one, Lord God. God, cause them to be of one mind. Cause them to be in accord with you, Jesus. Cause them, cause it to happen, Jesus. And Lord, Urabashi. Jesus, I pray for every pastor, every man of God, every man that you have put in a position of leadership in the churches, Lord, in your church, Lord God. I pray for boldness in the Holy Ghost, Lord God. I pray for the fire of God to touch them and change them to preach the gospel according to your will, Lord God, without holding back the truth, the truth, the truth, and nothing but the truth. In Jesus' name, Holy Ghost, Lord God, we're calling on you we're crying out to you Lord God it ain't gonna happen Lord unless you pour out your spirit father Lord we're crying for a move we're crying for a move oh thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord Jesus everybody just lift your voices to God and pray for God to break through wherever your burden to pray if it's for the church if it's for young people it's for the schools the elections However you feel led and burdened, you pray right now. You pray in Jesus' name.
And uh, what was it, 19 people were killed, something like that. And when the fire broke out, it was something like 5 in the morning. It was right in the, the heat of party time. And I thought, th think of living your life like that, that 5 in the morning, you're partying. That, that your life revolves around that. And then so many people in God's house just want to get in and get out, kind of do their weekly duty. But that's not why you're here. I know that. You didn't come from different parts of the world and different parts of the country just to go to church. You can stay home and go to church. And especially if you've got dull cookie cutter services at home, there's no reason to go halfway across the world for a dull cookie cutter service somewhere else. Amen? So we, we were going to pray for one other thing, but, but we'll wait to do that. And uh, I, I heard a familiar sound on the bass there. So uh, let me just invite any of you that, that just need to break out and just need a little push to do it. And, 
And, and so you may see people celebrating, dancing, jumping in here, but they didn't always do that. And you don't have to do that in order to worship God. And some of you might wish you could, but physically you're unable to. But some of you are just held back because you're, you're afraid or you care what people think or you don't want to look stupid. And uh, you probably look more stupid just standing there like this when everybody around you is jumping and dancing. But it was, uh, I don't know, about 17 years ago, God really convicted me because I didn't get saved in a dancing church and then I was in another kind of non-dancing church. And God convicted me that I'd be alone worshiping and you know just kind of cutting loose and dancing and celebrating it. And I held back in the presence of others and it was because I, I cared about it. Or I cared about what others thought. I didn't feel as free and I just had to consciously break out. So it looks like we're gonna do one more song that's a potential breakout song or no. Yes, no? Yeah. Yes? Okay. So if you want to, t tell you what, unless you really need to sit, okay, and no one's going to judge you if you sit. We won't just stare at you if you're sitting. Cameramen just get all those that are sitting. You don't have to stand, but it'd be great if everyone that could stand just stands one more time, all right? And those that need to break out a little bit and, and j just need to get free, why don't you push your way out of the pew and... And, and you'll just blend in with everybody else here. And you may not stay free when you get home unless you really make the determination to, but at least one night you can feel, feel what it feels like. Is that all right? <laughs> Hallelujah.
last time but by his mercy I've been spared it's not by works but faith in him who called for so long I've been hindered for so long I've been stoned and I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb come on sing Jesus, we praise you. Jesus, we praise you. We magnify you, God. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, make this declaration together with me. Heavenly Father, in the sight of heaven and earth, we declare that Jesus alone is Lord. We declare that he died for our sins that he rose from the dead. He triumphed over death and hell. He broke the power of the enemy. He ascended on high. He sent his spirit and power. And in him we live. In him we die to sin. In him. We triumph over Satan. In him, we are more than conquerors. We exalt the name of Jesus. Praise him. Go ahead. Jesus. Jesus alone is Lord. Jesus alone is Lord. Jesus alone is Lord. There is no competition. There is no rivalry. Jesus alone is Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. I want you to just take a minute and think of every challenge in your own life, everything in your own life that threatens or brings into question the Lordship of Jesus, everything that comes against you and says, if he's really Lord, then what about this? If he's really Lord, then why is this still in your life? If he's really Lord, why hasn't this changed? If he's really Lord, why is that happening? I want you to just stop for a minute. 
There may be one or two things that rise up in you immediately, the challenges that you're hit with, the, the attacks, the lies of the enemy, the circumstances you face, and they're really challenging the Lordship of Jesus. I want you to just take one moment. I want you to look that thing right in the face. I want you to look it head on, whatever it is. And I want you just one more time to raise your hands with me and proclaim out loud that Jesus is Lord. Jesus, just do it. Do it on your own. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, Lord of all. Lord over every circumstance. Lord over every satanic attack. Lord over every device of hell. Lord, Lord of all. Name above every name. King and conqueror. Jesus, Jesus. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. It's written in the book of Zechariah, an end time passage. God says the day of the Lord is coming when your plunder will be divided among you, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured, the houses ransacked, the women raped, half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. And it says, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. There is a spiritual challenge going on. It's been going on for many centuries. It's intensifying, and it has intensified in the last 40 or 50 years. It's a challenge to the Word of God. It's a challenge to the Lordship of Jesus. It's a challenge that says, God, you'll never restore the Jewish people back to the land. And it's a challenge that says, well, Jerusalem will never be in Jewish hands for good. And it's a challenge that ultimately says, God, your word's not true because you don't have the power to bring to pass what you've promised. And it's a challenge that says, Jesus will never come back to Jerusalem like he said. See, this is a spiritual battle. This is not a matter of Arab versus Jew. This is a spiritual battle. And we would not be right in the sight of God if we didn't take a minute and just pray for God's will to be done right now in the Middle East. I want you to just sit down for, for two or three minutes, and then we're just going to agree together in prayer before we go on. I've got something burning in my heart that is going to impact you intensely tonight. You may have heard the news that there was a resolution passed by the UN condemning Israel and their excessive use of force and violence against the Palestinians. It passed 92 to 6. Just in the last 24 hours, two of the six nations voting against the absurd resolution were Israel and the United States. A few days before that, the UN Security Council condemned Israel for crimes against humanity. And uh, the U.S. in that one, instead of vetoing it, simply abstained to our shame. And of course, in none of these resolutions there, is there a single word about how the violence started or a single word condemning, say, the, the mass beating murder of, of the Israeli soldiers in Ramallah. I just want you to, to get a little history on this, though, so you understand what we're up against, and then we're going to pray. I'm going to be quoting some things from my book, Our Hands Are Stained With Blood, which you can get in the bookstore or order online or get in other bookstores. Just, just give you a little feeling of the, the history here, because the UN is always raising a cry on behalf of Palestinians, and we need to pray for these people. Most all of them are Muslims that don't know the Lord. We need to pray for God's mercy in their lives. But I just raise a question, where was the world outcry from the United Nations, from the U.S. Senate, from the media when Jordan killed more than 3,400 of its own Palestinians during just 10 days of the infamous Black September riots of 1970? Of course, most of you never heard of those. Or when Syria slaughtered 23,000 Palestinians in 1976? Of course, you don't hear about that. When 19 Arabs were shot to death during the Temple Mount uprising October 8, 1990, the U.N., with the agreement of America soundly condemned Israel's use of force. But where is the condemnation a few days later when Syrian troops raped and massacred several hundred Lebanese Christians after the Lebanese had surrendered? 
Of course, this is no surprise. The UN Security Council did not respond to Syria's killing as many as 30,000 of its civilians in Hamas, Syria in 1982, the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, the Tiananmen Square massacre in China, or the Iraqi Air Force's gassing of 8,000 Kurds in 1988-1989. One uh, Arab scholar, Lebanese man, actually said at a, a, a conference where I was at, uh, at one time, that if Israel uses tear gas, the world is up in arms, Iraqi could use nerve gas on its own people and it never even gets reported. That's just the fact. Let me just give you a bit more history. 1973, just four days after the Arab nations attacked Israel on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the Security Council of the United Nations exploded into prolonged applause when Yaakov Malik of the Soviet Union called the Israelis murderers and international gangsters. Then on October 1st, 1975, the infamous Idi Amin of Uganda, already well known as a savage mass murderer and cannibal who ate the refrigerated body parts of his victims, addressed the United Nations and received a standing ovation from the UN General Assembly both before and after his speech. His message? He denounced the Zionist American conspiracy and called for the expulsion of Israel from the UN as well as Israel's extinction. The next day, the next day, the UN Security General gave a public dinner in Idi Amin's honor. The thing you need to understand also is that as much as the Israelis are sinful people that need Jesus, and probably I've, I've called Jewish people and Israelis to repentance more than anybody in this room just because of my life calling and experience, it's a wild thing when you see how stuff is reported worldwide. And just for an example, before Israel bombed certain buildings in retaliation for the murder of some of their soldiers, they warned people to get out of the buildings because they were going to be bombed. When there was a 12-year-old Palestinian boy killed a couple of weeks ago, he could have been involved in a rock-throwing incident. It's still not clear whether it was Israeli fire or Palestinian fire that killed him. All over Israel, there were groups rising up, calling for a thorough investigation of what happened and, and saying too much force is being used. This is within Israel. And on the other hand, over and over and over on, on the, the Muslim broadcasts, the Muslim sermons very clearly and loudly in the mosques have been calling for the extermination of the Jewish people. This is as, as all this is going on. So we need to take God's side in this. There is an attack, there is a threat, there is a challenge to the lordship of Jesus from the kingdom of Islam, from the kingdom of Satan. And while we love individuals and pray for individuals and know that Israel in itself is not perfectly right and Palestinians in themselves are not totally wrong, we know that God's purposes are to stand with Israel when the world clearly stands against Israel. When the UN stands against Israel, we're, we're living in historic times and it would be foolhardy of us to sleep our way through, all right? So I just want to ask you one more time to stand with us and, and Lord, why don't you come? We're just going to pray. Unless the Spirit falls dramatically, we're just going to lift up prayer briefly for God to intervene, for God to have his way, for God to break out on behalf of the Jewish people, on behalf of the land. Just let me say a few things before we pray. Just today on the news, as I was watching the news this afternoon, they were interviewing Vice President Candidate Cheney, and they were asking him, why is it that Mr. Bush, in his debates, can only say that he is standing for Israel? Is this his answer? Is this his policy? And the moderator, the newscaster that was asking him these questions was trying to say, listen, we also want peace. So give to the Palestinians what they want. You see, it's like this room here. All of you being the great majority and a few people up here being the small nation of Israel. So it's a great multitude that causes the noise. And as Dr. Brown said, it's not a battle of flesh and blood. It's a battle of Allah against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The true and living God. And he had no answer. He said it's a difficult question. It takes time. We have to work together. We don't know the answer. But friends, we have the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer. And if only the eyes of the Jewish people could be open to their Messiah. Because these people should be able to tell America 
These candidates running for office should be able to tell Americans the only answer to peace in the Middle East is Jesus Christ. But apparently that's not politically correct. So they can't use the word of Jesus. They say we don't know the answer. But we know the answer. And we can pray for the answer. All across America on Christian radio stations right now, the mayor of Jerusalem, he has an announcement. And he's asking Christians to call this toll-free number and protest because the Palestinians want Jerusalem or a part of Jerusalem to be their territory. The garden tomb where many of us visit, they want to control that. And many other places that are under Jewish control, the Palestinians want control. So the mayor is telling all of us Christians, please call and protest because do us Christians want the Palestinians in charge of these areas? He said, do we want Islam in charge of these areas? Of course the answer is no. But here's the problem. The mayor continued to say that Jerusalem, we just want to be the city of peace, the center of all religions. We want all religions to come and enjoy. So he's mistaken also. Because God is not impressed with those words. Because God is the one that gave Jerusalem to the Jewish people. God didn't give it to anyone else. So regardless of how they behave, regardless of if they are wrong at times, it's not a matter if they are wrong or right, it's a matter that it's God's place. Jesus Christ himself will return and rule in Jerusalem. And we know that peace will come one day, but before Jesus comes, peace will come, but it will be peace by a false Messiah, and they would welcome him, and he'll bring peace. He'll bring peace until three years or so. He'll set himself up in the temple and say, I am your God, worship me. So as we pray now, and the listeners on 95.7 where I heard the mayor's voice, the owners of that station don't have you listening to this service just for fun, just because you couldn't come here tonight. We want you to be a part of this service. This service is for you. And we can join together, get your families together, and join us now as we pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one true living God, the God that sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who is the only answer. So let's pray with a purpose. Let's lift our voices to heaven. We can do it. Do you believe? Let's join our voices together. Father, we know that you are the one true and living God. I'm going to pray. Just believe with me. Father, we know that you are the one true and living God. We know that Jerusalem is your city. We know that peace can only come when the eyes of your peoples are free. The blinders are removed. So, Father, we lift our voices together now. We ask you, please, to remove the blinders, God. Set your people free, God. Prepare their hearts to receive your son, Jesus. Let Jesus be glorified in Israel, oh God. Bring peace to the nation. Open the eyes of the politicians in America. Father, open their hearts. Father, intervene in Israel and bring peace even now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Do you believe it? Say amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me just mention, I'm, I'm not speaking on this tonight, but a word you're going to hear a lot these days is the word revolution. It's a violent and radical word, but we're not talking about the violent overthrow of the government. We're not talking about a revolution of guns and knives and bombs. We're not talking about shooting abortion doctors or bashing gays. We're talking about a radical Jesus revolution which is the only hope of this nation and the only hope of the world. Uh, just saw the latest Charisma magazine and on the front cover and then in the major picture, uh, there's a, uh, you'll see a man holding up a book and uh, you'll see the back cover, it says it's time for revolution. It's a picture from the call of DC where Park Police said there were 300,000 gathered together, mainly young people. It would make it, I believe, the largest gathering of Christian young people in our nation's history. 
And we were there with 15 buses, with uh, about 800 students from the School of Ministry. Amen. Went 20 hours by bus just to get there. I was given about a half hour to preach on the theme of revolution. And uh, this book that I've written called Revolution, The Call of the Holy War, literally had just come out. Uh, we gave away more than 70,000 copies of the Revolution book on that day. And uh, we are absolutely committed to seeing a spiritual and moral revolution in our land. Our school of ministry is committed to that. And I want to encourage you, again, the bookstore is closed. You can't get anything here now. But when you get back home, go to your bookstore, get the book Revolution if you don't have it, or uh, get it from any of the online bookstores, or get, it, get on our ministry website, which is ICN Ministries, stands for Israel, the Church, and the Nation, icnministries.org. And you can uh, get the book and more information on materials there having to do with sparking a revolution. How many of you were uh, here through the entire week? You got here for prayer meeting Tuesday. You've been here for the entire week. Just raise your hands. Okay? Put your hands down. Uh, how many were here Wednesday night? Wednesday doesn't have to be the other nights too, but how many were here Wednesday night? Just raise your hand. I know it's jarring your memory. I know it's a long ways back, but thanks. Hang on. You can... Okay, how, how many were here Thursday night? All right. Put your hands down. How many were here last night? Okay. How many are here tonight? All right. Good. I had uh, said last night that I had something on my heart that I was going to preach on, and uh, subject to change, of course. And over the course of, of the day and up last night seeking the Lord, God, God began dealing with me about a passage that was actually used and preached on last night. I had been reading the Word. I had been in that passage actually just a few hours before the meeting last night. And there's some truths in there that I believe we need to hit on and, and look at. So I want you to turn with me to 2 Samuel, the 6th chapter. If you need a title, you can call it, Be Careful How You Handle the Holy. Be Careful How You Handle the Holy. Don't forget, if you need to find your way around the Word better and you don't know where 2 Samuel is, it immediately follows 1 Samuel. Okay? How many of you have it in your Bibles? All right. I mean, it's, if you have a Bible, it's in your Bible. I mean, how many, how many found it? All right. Let's pray. Father, you've spoken to me very clearly. You've burned these truths in my heart. And I pray, God, that the eyes of our understanding might be opened, that we would hear from heaven, that your word would speak with clarity and power and force and might. Father, we confess as closely as we know you, in many ways we really don't know you. We pray that you would make yourself real this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Many of you know the passage. If you were here last night, you heard about the ark of the Lord bearing the presence of the Lord. We heard something very important last night, how God's presence drives out other forces, other powers. When God's presence comes in, things happen. That's the essence of revival, the manifest presence of God. It's the key thing needed in a church and in an individual life, the presence and power of God. But there are texts that we have in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament that tell us that the presence of God is not cheap that the presence of God is not trite, that the presence of God cannot be reduced to formulas, that the presence of God is holy, that the presence of God is sacred, and we must be careful in terms of our handling that which is holy, in terms of our interaction with the presence of God. We're going to go through most all of this chapter in a minute, but what happened is this, there's background to the chapter. When God called the children of Israel out of Egypt, even though he made it clear that he was invisible, 
that you could not just isolate him or put him in any one place. He desired to manifest his presence in the midst of Israel. When Solomon went to build a temple for the Lord, Solomon said, Lord, the heavens, the highest heavens can't contain you. Nancy and I, my wife and I, were, were sitting, looking out on the beach the other night and, and just looking out at some of the stars, and she asked me how many galaxies there were. Science is not my best subject, but I knew there are a lot, a lot of galaxies. And I know that our galaxy is absolutely, vastly huge. And, and you think of, of the hugeness of the universe, and that universe can't contain God. Solomon understood, I, I can't put you in a house. Yet God would manifest his glory and his presence and power. He would manifest himself over the Ark of the Covenant, and his glory would be there. And it was very sacred. There are specific rules and laws, you can read about it in Numbers, the fourth chapter, that, that people could not touch the ark. And when it was carried, there would be posts that would be jutting out of the side, and, and only the Levites, only those specifically selected for the job could carry it. And they would carry it by those posts so as not to touch it. And it was sacred, you couldn't look in it. And it symbolized the presence of God. And when Israel was fighting against their enemies in the days of Eli, they were going out to fight against the Philistines, but they themselves were in sin, and they were losing against the Philistines. So they got this brainstorm. If we could just bring the ark of God with us, it would be like a good luck charm. It would be, we'd become invincible. Sometimes you'll see an athlete wearing a cross, and that's their good luck charm. If, if we can get the ark of God with us, that'll mean that God is with us, and, and that will mean that when we go out to fight against the Philistines, surely we'll win. Except God was not on Israel's side that day because Israel was in sin, and they were under divine judgment. And when they brought the ark, and when they shouted, the Philistines were terrified. They thought, oh no, Israel's God is in their midst. Let's fight like we never fought before. And they fought, and they defeated Israel, and 30,000 Israelites were killed. And the ark of the Lord was taken. What a shocker. Before we get into this chapter, I want you to understand something. God will not violate his principles. You might say, but look at how bad it looks for the Lord. Look at how bad it looks. I mean, here Israel's God was defeated. That's how the Philistines saw it. That's how the nation saw it. The God of Israel went out to battle with Israel and Israel lost. It made God look bad. It's a fact that for that moment, it made God look bad. But God will not violate his principle. If there's sin in the camp, if our lives are not right, if we think we can play games with that which is holy and call ourselves Christians and say, well, God's going to have to back me because I call out in the name of Jesus and I carry a Bible with me and I have a Jesus t-shirt and I have Jesus bumper stickers and our church talks about Jesus, Jesus. God's going to have to back me even though there's sin in the camp. Otherwise, the name of Jesus will look bad. He will let the name of Jesus look bad. Because it's a greater mockery of who he is to sanction sin. It's a greater mockery of who he is to violate his principles. He will see to it that his name is glorified and everyone finds out that he is the true God. But he may see to it by judging us rather than exalting us. He will show himself holy even if it brings shame and disgrace to his name. Well, no sooner do the Philistines have the ark there that they find out they got a problem with this ark because there is a real God associated with it. He begins to mock and judge the gods of the Philistines. And as the presence of God is there with that ark, it brings down the gods of the nations and they finally realize we're getting smitten, we're getting judged here, we can't have this ark here, we better send it back. So they hatch a plan in 1 Samuel 6. The priests and the diviners of the Philistines say, look, let's put this thing just on a cart and, and let, let's have some oxen just pulling this thing and that, that aren't used to going in any direction and let's see which way they go and if they head back to Israel, we'll know it's God. And it gets back to Israel and, and it says that the people of, of Beth Shemesh see the ark coming and they rejoice, the ark of the covenant's back, they're all excited, praise the Lord, hallelujah, isn't this wonderful? God's back, revival's here, the presence of God is near. 
And they begin to offer sacrifices and do everything they know how to do, and they get so excited, they go look in this thing, and 70 of them are smitten. Some texts give higher numbers than that. Some of the manuscripts do. And they realize, whoa, wait one second. We are not too keen about having God live in our midst. See, we don't know what we pray for when we say, oh, God, come in power in my life. We don't know what we're praying for. Every so often it dawns on me some of the words that we're singing, set us on fire. What person in their right mind prays to be set on fire? The only reason we pray it is because they're just empty words to us that have no meaning. I remember one time a guy prayed for me and he said, oh God, turn up the anointing a hundredfold. I'm glad God didn't answer that prayer because even a tiny measly anointing turned up a hundredfold will kill you on the spot. You'll explode in a million pieces. But we pray those prayers because there's no reality to it. When you hear a hurricane's coming and it's a real hurricane and you've lived through a hurricane and they say it's a big hurricane. What, what's, what's the worst rating of a hurricane? Is it a four or five? Totally destructive. When you hear it's really coming, you don't say, hey, do you want to go out sailing today? You'd only say it if... if a hurricane, a level five hurricane. It's just empty words, preacher's words, religious words, spiritual words. See, friends, we have very little of the fear of God in our midst because we talk big and see very little. We have very little of the fear of God in our midst because we talk about the power of God, the visitation of God, and see very little of his judgment. I always find it cute when we're praying for someone. And we say, sister, the power of God is all over you. That always strikes me as on. Now, sometimes people just have to take hold of something by faith, and then they receive, even though there's no evidence of any kind that God is moving. But, I mean, when, when do you go out in the middle of a rainstorm? You're standing there under the umbrella. Someone else is getting absolutely sopped and soaked in there. Do you ever say, man, the rain is all over you. Don't you know it? No, I had no idea. I had no idea I was wet. I had no idea I was getting pulverized by this downpour. Man, you're standing there on hot coals. Oh, I, I had no idea. Sister, the power of God's all over you. Sometimes we have to tell them because it's not happening, because it's not real. By the way, you can leave now. If I'm going to mess with your spiritual fantasy, you can leave now. They look in the ark, and they start dying like flies, and they panic, get this thing out of here. See, the Israelites started to panic after. They said, we want God. God, deliver us from Egypt. Oh, God, set us free. Bring us out. The Israelites are delivered from Egypt, and God begins to live among them, and they start dying when they sin. They start to reconsider. You know, Lord, we asked you to stay for a while, but just that one quick visit was great. We'll write to you next year, Lord. So they don't know what to do with the ark. And they say, look, look, bring it, bring it over to Kiryat Yarim. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. And it, it stays there, and it languishes there more than 50 years, ultimately, in the house of Abinadab. So now, David has become king. He was king over Judah for seven years now. All of Israel wants him as king. And several times in the previous chapter, he has mustered his fighting men to fight against the Philistines. So yet again, chapter 6, verse 1, David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all his men set out from Bala of Judah, which is another name for Kiryat Yarim, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it, so presumably Uzzah was walking behind it. David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with songs and with harps, lyres, tambourines, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nachon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled 
The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Just flip over one moment to 1 Chronicles chapter 15. If it's going to take you a while to find it, just listen. 1 Chronicles... Look at what it says. Verse 11, Then David summoned Zadok and Aviathar, the priests, and Uriel, Asaiah, Yoel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Aminadab, the Levites. He said to them, You are the heads of the Levitical families. You and your fellow Levites are to consecrate yourselves and bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared for it. It was because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. The word tells us exactly why the Lord was angry. Numbers 4.15 makes it perfectly clear there was a prescribed way to handle the ark. They were not to touch it, and only the Levites were to carry it, and we have no evidence that Uzzah and his brother were Levites, that their father was a Levite. They meant well. They thought they were being helpful. The text clearly says the oxen stumbled. And they reached out their hand. They thought, uh-oh, the ark's going to fall. They were careful, but they didn't do it God's way. See, there's a lesson here for us. There's something we're supposed to learn. 1 Corinthians 10 and Romans 15 tell us whatever was written before, whatever happened to Israel is there as an example for us. We can trivialize the holy. We can get so familiar with the holy. We just reach out our hand and touch things and don't realize what we're doing. David said, we didn't do it in the prescribed way. God had said, don't touch it, carry it on these poles. He said, but wasn't God a little bit harsh? I mean, after all, this guy meant well. Why did God do what he did? There are a few reasons. One is God will sanctify his name, and God does things so that we come to understanding. God sometimes does things in public ways to wake us up. Sometimes when a leader falls in a public way, it's their sin, it's their responsibility. But God allows it to come up to the surface or even brings it up to the surface. Even though it makes him look bad, he does it to sanctify his church. He does it to say, I'm holy and I don't tolerate sin. He does it as a wake-up call to the rest of us. Don't play games. There's something else here, though, and it's important for those that have been touched in revival. And maybe it's been six months or a year or two or, or five plus years like in this church. You've been around certain movings of God and manifestations of God. We read right at the beginning that David went to get the ark from the house of Abinadab. And his two sons, Uzzah and Ahio. Do you realize what that's saying? The ark had been in that house for decades. Those boys, Uzzah and Ahio, grew up around the ark. They should have known better than to touch it. Perhaps having grown up around it, it was not so sacred to them. Perhaps having grown up around it, it was not so holy to them. Perhaps there was not so much fear. You know the saying, familiarity breeds contempt. You get so close to something, you get so familiar with it, you get so used to it, you begin to take it for granted. Maybe you've had hands laid on you so many times, it's just kind of like a little game. Squeeze to the front, push to the front, get prayed for, fall out. Oh, I'll go get someone else to pray for me. Maybe when you see the power of God touch people, it's just become like a little game, and you laugh, and wow, wasn't that amazing, and wasn't that something? Friends, God is not just a showman. Jesus didn't pray for someone with two good eyes and give them a third eye. He wasn't just trying to put on some spectacle. God's not some grand entertainer. This is sacred stuff. The laying on of hands is sacred. Worshiping God, raising hands to Him is sacred falling on our faces, dancing in his presence. This is sacred stuff. 
The presence of God is sacred, holy. Healing is sacred. Deliverance is sacred. Most sacred of all is his act of salvation. The word of God, the preaching of the word, this is sacred stuff. We get so familiar with it. We get so familiar with having a service and doing this and going on with our Christian agenda. We spend very little time prostrate on our face saying, God, I honor you. Some of you may have been here Thursday night and said, Brother, didn't you preach on the goodness of God? Yes, I did. If he wasn't so holy, he wouldn't be so good. He'd be corrupt. He'd be polluted. He'd, he'd be somehow compromised, but he is not. He is absolute, total purity. And the blood of Jesus does not lessen the character of God. The blood of Jesus doesn't change the character of God, so now we can just freely, flippantly come into his presence because now he's big daddy God because he, he, there's, no, there's no lordship, there's no, no authority anymore because the blood of Jesus just kind of cheapened him. Anything goes. No. The blood of Jesus doesn't change the nature of God. The blood of Jesus changes us. So now through the blood of Jesus, we are made worthy to enter the presence of God. I don't come cowering, trembling, fearful when I go in the presence of God because I know I'm washed. I know I'm clean. I know I've been justified by the blood of Jesus. I know I want to please the master, but I don't go into his presence flippantly. These texts are here to tell us something. God's presence is not to be handled lightly. And the more God moves, the more we need to take hold of the seriousness of it. The more God anoints you, my friend, the more the Spirit of God has set apart your life, the more promises have been given to you, the more you've seen the evidence of God's gracious dealing with you. Be careful about the way you live your life. Be careful about the influences that you allow into your life. Be careful about the decisions that you make. We've been set apart to be holy to the Lord. God said to Israel, you shall be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. If we're going to get along, if we're going to live together, we're going to have to become like him. That's what he's saying. All through Israelite society, there were divisions that were made. When you think of the, the, the making of the most holy items in the tabernacle and so on, they, they were made with gold, and then the next ones out would be made with silver, and then the next ones out bronze. You just think of the animals. Some animals were unclean. The Israelites couldn't eat them. Others were clean, but not acceptable for sacrifice because they were not without blemish. And then there were others that were acceptable for sacrifice. Three levels. The unclean, the clean, and the holy. Bronze, silver, gold. The people of Israel. There were some people that were defiled and they were unclean. They couldn't come in the camp. Then there was the camp of all the people. And then there were those set apart as holy, the Levites and the priests unclean clean and holy god calls us to be holy god calls us to live as priests god calls us to live different lives because god lives in us because now our very bodies have been made the temple of the holy spirit how then should we live we have not been just redeemed from egypt we have been washed with the blood of jesus and redeemed from sin and hell how should we live We've been given the deposit of the Holy Spirit living within us and eternal life and been brought into God's family and made a kingdom of priests. How should we live? When I was first saved, I got hungry for the Word and started reading the Word. But I was brand new and, and I'd be reading the Word and maybe watching television and looking up at the TV then looking down reading the Word. And I thought, no, this is no good. I've got to get more serious with this. And I lay down in bed and start reading the Word, and I'm not putting this on you, and, and this is not my daily habit today. I don't mean to be legalistic about it. I just mean the dealings of God in my own life as a new believer. I, I started to read the Word, laying down. I, I read and read and read, and I thought, you know, I, I'm just too casual with this thing. I'm too casual with my time with God and the Word. So I decided I'm going to sit at my desk in my room as a 16, 17-year-old and read the Word sitting at the desk. And then after a while, I thought, I'm just too casual about this thing. How can I read the Word and not be on my knees? And there was a period of many months, and it was a sacred period in my life, where if I was going to read the Word, and I don't mean if I was driving a car or sitting on a bus somewhere, but when I was home alone, if I was going to read the Word, I'd get on my knees because I wanted to reverence God and say, this is the sacred Word. It's not just some promise book 